research. If you work on photon related research, you know about Eli's name. When I was still a graduate student, that was many years ago, and he was already so well known. He's the father of photonic band gap concept. If you look back the history, the photonic crystal, this research field is super exciting. So when that was the time when I was a student. And then when I joined the Stanford faculty 18 years ago, start to work on solar cell, I discovered, I look at that, there's a limit named after him called Yablonovich limit. Well, his name is everywhere. You cannot really escape uh, uh, from uh, Eli's footprint if you work on something related to photon. And uh, well, he also introduced the idea of strain semiconductor lasers. He was directing this NSF Center for Energy Efficient Electronic Science. Um, he uh, funded uh, companies to commercialize uh, the high efficiency solar cell technologies. He's the member of NAS, National Academy of Science, Nas uh, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Inventors. Uh, what well, he has uh, a lot of wisdom. Today's topic is very different. I look at his recent work. He moved into thinking about CO2 capture using biomass. I was a little bit surprised. I said, if there's no photons, Eli can also do it. Well, there's a little bit photon right there because you know, photosynthesis using photons. Well, well, Eli just told me, he said, well, 40 years ago, he actually looked at this problem before. Without further ado, and uh, Eli. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm glad to see uh, so many people are interested in this uh, subject. Um, so, uh, I should first mention my co-author, Harry Deckman. He, this is somebody I used to work with uh, 40 years ago uh, when I was working on solar cells. And so it might come as a surprise if you work on solar cells, uh, it does have some implications toward photosynthesis and uh, biomass. Uh, so th the first thing to notice is that uh, whereas we used to talk just about carbon neutrality. This was as recently as five years ago. Uh, since that time, people have come to realize it's uh, not enough to be carbon neutral. You actually have to pull uh, carbon dioxide out of the air. And uh, there are a number of reasons for it. Uh, first of all, for aviation, the amount of hours you can stay in the air depends upon the energy to mass ratio of the fuel. Turns out jet fuel is uh, uh, just for the highest practical uh, fuel with the highest energy to mass ratio. And that enables us to have uh, very long intercontinental flights. Uh, one, uh, sort of a, ni a nice calculation if you're a very ambitious uh, physics student is uh, given the energy to mass ratio, which is, first you have to figure out you know, how much a gallon of gasoline weighs and you have to figure out how much energy it has and so forth. Uh, given that energy to mass ratio, why is it that the longest flight that you can take is 19 hours? And that's enough that there's, there are scheduled flights from Dallas to Singapore. So that, that's made possible by the energy density of hydrocarbon fuel. So we're, it's going to be difficult to get rid of hydrocarbons in that way. Then there's another reason why we can't get rid of hydrocarbons. And that's for summer, winter energy storage. And uh, that's true even in, uh, in here in Northern California. It does get uh, uh, cold. We do uh, heat our houses. And uh, one of the things you notice, I used to be at uh, Bell Labs. I would land at Newark Airport and I would look down and all I would see was a sea of oil storage tanks. And what, are th what they're doing is they're uh, storing the oil they make in the uh, summertime, the heating oil, they're storing it for the winter time. And that form of energy storage is so inexpensive that it adds about a penny a gallon to the cost of the fuel oil. So uh, it's, it's not enough to have batteries. We need to have uh, seasonal storage and it's a very difficult economic problem because you get to you put all this money into it and then you get to use it only once a year uh, so uh, that's that's a problem and there's another problem uh, and of course th that's sort of a reason why we're sort of stuck we might be stuck with hydrocarbons uh, there's another reason is that there will always be some countries that do not cooperate and so if they don't cooperate what are you going to do 
Uh, you have to pull their carbon dioxide out of the air. You have other ways of, of dealing. Maybe you send them a bill, uh, but uh, it, it has to be done. So those are three reasons. And a, a more speculative reason, uh, there are some climate models that, that say that uh, positive feedback of CO2 and, and methane from permafrost can lead to a thermal runaway. And uh, so in that case, we have to go into, into the past and pull out the old carbon dioxide too. And uh, so it says carbon neutral is not good enough. I think people agree with that now. And carbon dioxide removal is needed. So as a result, a number of reports have come out uh, about five years ago from uh, the uh, different national academies. This is the American one. This is the European one. This is a Physics Today article. But, uh, uh, and, and this is something that actually our government has just devoted uh, vast amounts of money, well, $1.2 billion, to pull carbon dioxide out of the air and pump it underground. Uh, the cost is at least $600 a metric ton. I'll explain about the costs uh, later on. Uh, but it's uh, uh, the, what the government is paying, they're paying $1,000 a ton of CO2. So uh, that's actually a very high cost. So that's, uh, uh, the, they're directly removing the CO2 is uh, probably not the most efficient way. So if you look at the European report, they uh, recognize this as a problem. So they suggest six ways of doing it. And I'll just mention them briefly, manipulating the forests, Okay, uh, land management to convince the farmers to do the farming differently, uh, burn the biomass and capture the carbon dioxide. Uh, then there are rocks which absorb carbon dioxide, and I just heard about that from, uh, 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 from my host, uh, Itre. And uh, so uh, th there, there's some hope there. Uh, and um, direct air capture and storage, yes, that's the one I just showed you, $1,000 a ton and then uh, fertilizing the ocean. So, I mean, some of these are, are viable, but there's one very important thing that they're missing, and, and it's very surprising, the safe burial of the uh, agricultural biomass. Uh, they're missing that, which is rather surprising because uh, it was almost 40 years ago, Freeman Dyson, who was one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century and, and very imaginative person, always thinking out of the box, and, and he wrote a paper already uh, in, in he wrote, I guess he wrote it in 1976, uh, and suggesting that we should grow trees and bury the logs, okay? And it turns out, uh, I, th I think that's the first paper I saw with that suggestion. It was kind of early. Uh, and uh, what's happening today, there are at least seven companies who are doing exactly that. These are just the ones I know about. I'm sure there are more. They're, uh, they're burying wood and uh, getting rid of the carbon that way. Um, so, and in, indeed, the idea of carbon removal is uh, now an X prize. So they're in the midst of uh, uh, identifying uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the best way of doing this. And I have here uh, just a little, uh, half a slide, a little calculation on the entropy associated with going from very dilute CO2 in the atmosphere to getting very dense CO2 in wood and it, it represents a considerable amount of free energy. This is a, a little bit of an underestimate because this is just concentrating the atmosphere. They have to get it into the wood. And where do you get this free energy uh, because from plants? Because they use sunlight and they do photosynthesis and they uh, create energy and they also capture uh, the carbon. So this can be done. It, it's, uh, I think it, it's close to a, a volt per CO2 molecule, of it, uh, electron volt per CO2 molecule that you have to provide. So much of what I'm going to be describing to you is built on the uh, very uh, pioneering work uh, in um, bio, uh, biomass energy, uh, bioenergy, and uh, we're very fortunate, and a lot of that work uh, came from Professor Steve Chu, who's here in the front row, and uh, they solved many of the problems associated with this. Uh, among them is to identify which is the best crop in each climate. Uh, so for example, miscanthus is, is a very good crop for the Midwest, uh, but uh, you have uh, Florida, you, of course you'd have a different climate, different crop, uh, and uh, Mexico, and so on. And in England, I was, re I was ready to give up on England because it's so far north and it doesn't get that much uh, sunlight, but they, ha they have something uh, for England as well. And uh, they, uh, the biofuel people, um, figured out which crop, the productivity of the crop, what it costs, and so forth. So these are some of the crops they identified. 
and, uh, and some of the things like uh, the more in the tropical regions, elfin grass, uh, a lot of emphasis on algae, a little bit misplaced. But what is the main point is that if you grow a non-food crop, uh, there are great advantages. They are more productive for the farmers. Uh, so you get more tons of uh, biomass uh, per acre. And, uh, the, um, and then the insects, it's not food for the insects either. So uh, the farmer doesn't have to use uh, any insecticide, maybe uh, only a little bit, maybe none at all. Okay, and your productivity is much greater. So for example, uh, these biofuel crops, they're three times more productive than maize. So what is maize? So I gave this talk in Europe, and uh, if, you, uh, if you tell them uh, wheat, they, they get, a, uh, or they, to corn, they get very confused by, by corn. Uh, they, they think corn is wheat, and so you have to use a different word, maize. So if you, uh, that's just uh, something to learn about the uh, difference in the English, lang English language. So um, you could extract a lot of carbon from an acre, and, but you'd need a lot of acres. And uh, so but it would become a very large agricultural enterprise. So I was uh, motivated to this. Uh, uh, you heard I, I started this uh, 40 years ago. Uh, so I had a, a mentor 40 years ago. I started working on f uh, solar cells and a mentor, and this guy it was Al Rose, and he was a, uh, a big guy from the RCA labs. Well, probably none of you even know what RCA is anymore. Uh, but it was, uh, in its time, it, it created radio, then it created television, then it created color television. Uh, Al Rose, shortly after he graduated, he was recruited. Uh, by Vladimir Zorkin, like the original people back in the 1930s, and he invents the Viticon camera, so he becomes uh, a very big guy in, um, in uh, television it, it, it was in the very early days. And one day he comes to me, he's my mentor, so he tells me, Eli, uh, you passed some uh, gas stations on the way to work, and uh, the price of gas is high, and so uh, uh, why don't you look up the price of energy from corn on the Chicago Board of Trade. So now that's a little bit difficult. You look, at, uh, so you have to figure out, uh, okay, you go to Wall Street Journal, get the price of corn, then you have to figure out what bushels are, then how many bushels there are in a ton, and then you switch to metric tons and so on and so forth. And so you can figure, and then you, oh, then you also figure out the free energy, the gives free energy in the corn when you burn it, okay? and uh, compare it to the price of gasoline. So then you have to know how many megajoules there are in a gallon of gasoline, but uh, you do all this stuff. So I did all this stuff. I didn't realize that he had already published this and uh, he was, I don't know if he was teasing me, but he already worked it all out. And here, here's the answer. The price, the energy price of corn per megajoule, at least at that time, probably still pretty close today, uh, was uh, roughly the same as the price of gasoline per megajoule. And this sort of stunned me. Uh, that the uh, that agriculture could possibly be so efficient that it was competitive with the in terms of the energy industry. So ever since then, I have had a great respect for agriculture. In fact, occasionally uh, one gets invited to the University of Illinois, and uh, I remember checking in at a motel there and turning on the TV, and what you had was the crop reports, and I was fascinated. I was just glued to the television. Uh, uh, they were uh, talking about the crop reports and the weather and, and things that farmers are uh, concerned about. So uh, the uh, farming, so what do we do with the biomass? So I say we put it in a dry environmental chamber. In fact, I can give you the punchline uh, of the talk is that if you keep biomass dry, then it will last for millennia. And I'll show you the evidence for that. And so uh, this suggests then a way to Pull, safely pull the carbon dioxide out of the air. And part of keeping it dry is uh, you have four millimeters of polyethylene. This is a very tough, very tough uh, plastic, much thicker than you're used to, and very strong. And uh, you, um, uh, it's, it's similar to the way landfills, the most modern landfills are sealed this way with uh, very thick uh, polyethylene. And uh, the, the goal there is to keep uh, the uh, garbage from contaminating the groundwater. And we have the exact opposite goal. We, we, want, we don't want the groundwater to making our biomass wet. Because once it's wet, it's wet it, gets, it decomposes and gives you back your uh, carbon dioxide and methane, which is really bad. So we published this uh, in, in this article. So you can look it up. If you want to look it up, just 
look up my name, and my co-author has a very easy name, Deckman. Uh, if you can spell my name correctly, you'll find, you'll find this article. Okay, now, uh, we build very much on the knowledge that was gained from biofuel research. But uh, there, there's, uh, uh, there's a, a, an issue in biofuels is that you're starting with cellulose. So you're growing cellulose with the approximate chemical formula like this. And um, the, the biomass starts out half oxidized. So in order to turn this into fuel, you actually need to grow two acres of biomass to get one acre of fuel because you've already uh, half oxidized the carbon. As opposed to just putting the biomass into the ground where you get full credit for the acre right away. So the biofuel requires twice as much farming, uh, but nonetheless we learn a tremendous amount from the biofuel. Uh, first thing to know is why doesn't it work if we just throw the logs underground? is that there are microbes and uh, uh, different things, uh, fungi and so on, and they will basically anaerobically digest it. Of course, if it's, if it's aerobic, it'll, it'll decay into, into uh, carbon dioxide. But if it's anaerobic, it still decays because you have plenty of uh, 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 these uh, microbes, insects, and uh, fungi that can... Um, uh, that can eat it and turn it back into CO2, which wouldn't work out. And this is roughly how it goes. Uh, you start, let's say, with a chemical formula for cellulose, and unfortunately, the microbes get to it. It gets to, um, turns into carbon dioxide and methane. So uh, you don't want that. So uh, what about wood? So something interesting about wood is that it is 40% cellulose, and cellulose is, that's what this is, and it's, it, it's, it, the chemists can work with it. But it's also 30% lignin, which is a very tough, durable compound, which is similar to the grain of wood. I'm just looking at the podium here, and the wood has a kind of a grain, and uh, the, the, that uh, comes from a lignin. And what happens is the microbes, they tend to decompose the cellulose right away. The lignin stays behind, and so when you get older, you're all going to have houses, and you might dig up in your backyard, maybe doing some gardening, and you'll find a board that the contractors buried because they were too lazy to get rid of it, so they just left it underground. And you pick up the board, and, and some of the, the older people here will have had the experience. You pick up the board, and it looks like a board, but kind of, where's the weight? It's, it's very, very lightweight, and, and, uh, but it has the shape of a board. But you, uh, the cellulose is gone, and you, you, what you picked up is mostly lignin. So it's not like totally pointless. You get 30% sequestration from the lignin, but it's 30%, so that presents uh, uh, an economic disadvantage. So there's one more thing uh, scientific to understand here is a concept called water activity. So we all know uh, what relative humidity is, and uh, if... Uh, Luckily, we are in a relatively dry part of the country, but uh, sometimes it's really humid. Uh, and uh, then uh, we say, well, uh, wh how do we describe relative humidity if it's not the atmosphere? What if it's a piece of food, like a steak? I have here a picture of a steak, and uh, you could ask, uh, well, if water activity is like, uh, is like relative humidity, if it's a steak, when it's dry, we say it has a low water activity. And indeed, when you dry uh, uh, food like this, it tends to be uh, preserved. And uh, so you could apply this to any biomass. And uh, it, when it's very, very dry, it tends to suppress all biological metabolic activity. In fact, this has been researched. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll mention that at about 60% water activity, um, metabolism comes to a stop. Let me uh, mention uh, who has uh, researched this. So this has been researched by the Food and Drug Administration. If you want to put food on the supermarket shelf, and uh, sort of the inspector uh, looks at it and, and he says, well, what's the water activity? And say, oh, it's below 60%. He says, okay, puts, wraps some cellophane around it and put it on the shelf. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the principle of drying food is, is uh, of course, uh, well known. Another uh, part of the government, NASA, has studied this in great detail. And uh, why? Because they're, they're looking for life on other planets. What does life require? Well, it requires a little bit of moisture. So as you go below 95%, many bacteria poop out. Uh, yeasts uh, go away around 85%. And uh, various other 
yeasts and mildew, and finally at 60%, water activity, uh, things come to, by, metabolism comes to a stop. And the natives in the Pacific Northwest knew this. They, this is like uh, just a picture of salmon uh, drying, and they would, uh, of course, easy to, uh, to catch salmon, and they would dry it, and they, it was preserved. So uh, that's basically the punchline of the talk. If you dry it below 60% water activity, whenever I say water activity, just think relative humidity, below 60% water activity, uh, uh, you can preserve uh, carbon or uh, cellulose biomass. You can c preserve it. And so uh, now this is a little bit confusing because you have, on the one hand, you have on the horizontal axis water activity. So here's 60% and you're safe below 60%. But then there's weight percent, which is different. So at 60% water activity, it means the weight percent of uh, water is maybe in the 10 to 14% range. And so this is kind of interesting because uh, when corn, when farmers in the Midwest, when they grow corn, uh, the, uh, they can sell it on the Chicago Board of Trade. But then there's a requirement. The Chicago Board of Trade will take your corn, but it has to have less than 14% water. And, and so uh, then you can ship it around and it will last. So that's uh, something to know about. So uh, what about then putting the biomass underground in an environmental chamber? It doesn't have to be very big because you can uh, build it up maybe to uh, 30 meters tall and uh, covered over. Uh, the uh, land area is one ten thousandth of the land area needed for the agriculture. So, uh, so that's good. And uh, it's stable, and I'll, I'll show you the proof of that. So one of the, re the reasons it's stable, and the reason why this is done, is water does not easily get through polyethylene. Uh, and the amount of water it gets through is equivalent in a year. Let's say it was fully wet on one side, and, and on the inside, it's equivalent to 1.7 microns of liquid water every year. And when you have this much uh, dry biomass, it can easily take that up and still stay below uh, sixty percent. It lasts for thousands of years uh, uh, below sixty percent um, water activity. So uh, here, I think I can just go to the bottom line. Uh, it's a big problem, and uh, we I, it, it's commonly accepted that if we can uh, deal with uh, twenty billion metric tons of carbon dioxide every year, uh, we can do this. Uh, so fortunately, I go back to the biofuel research. And they have already uh, searched and done all the research on the crops, the growth, the productivity, and so forth. And they've written reports uh, where you're going to get the land. And so here's another report from the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, I have this way of sort of describing the amount of land that you would need. So the horizontal axis is representing the whole land area of the Earth. And then some of it is, is useless. The poles are covered in ice. There are parts that are very barren and so on and so forth. But a good part of it is agriculture, forestry, uh, the shrubs, and a little tiny segment for uh, freshwater lakes and cities and so on. Okay. Now, uh, how much is used for growing our food? So we tend to grow our food in row crops. So this is the amount. It, it turns out 11% of the Earth's surface is row crops. So uh, if you're bored uh, going, driving through Iowa, uh, nonetheless, it's 11% uh, of the Earth's surface is row crops like that. And then a lot of it is for pastures, for uh, our farm animals, and so on and so forth. And this blue rectangle is what you would need to capture 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide. So it would be a giant agricultural enterprise, but uh, something that is uh, within, uh, it's available, and, and you can actually make the rectangle, the blue rectangle, bigger. and. Uh, uh, do a lot more than just capturing one year's carbon dioxide. So what is this about agriculture? Well, we're pretty good at it. We've been doing it for 10,000 years. And um, uh, of the, um, so we need to know the cost. The, the biofuel research has given us the cost, but it, a different, there's controversy about costs. And so uh, the, um, uh, I like to do a sanity check. As a professor, sometimes my students tell me things, and I don't know if it's right. So I do a sanity check. So I look up the price of corn on the Chicago Board of Trade, back to that again, and uh, I, um, I can figure out what the farmers are making per acre, how much money they make per acre, 
and uh, how much what they produce and what it's going for and so on and so forth. So for a, approximately $500 an acre, uh, the uh, farmers um, uh, break even, well, do better than break even. That includes a profit and also includes the rental of the land. So $500 an acre, that's what it costs. So from that, you can figure out what is it going to cost for the CO2. And uh, so it works out to be, and this was already done by the biofuel people, so uh, the, uh, about $30 a ton just for the agricultural part. So that's $30 a ton. And then for the sequestration, the environmental chamber, um, the trucking to the environmental chamber, all of that stuff, and the, uh, the cost of the fertilizer and the CO2 cost of the fertilizer and the N2O problem, et cetera. Uh, so that's another $30. So it ends up that uh, for different crops, it's, it's roughly, it's not that different. For different crops, it's about 30 plus 30, so $60 a ton of CO2. And now I convert that, uh, so this is like um, the uh, advanced placement test for the high school students, convert $60 a ton to dollars per gallon of gasoline, so that's a simple units conversion, and it comes out to be 53 cents a gallon of gas. So I would say that's a, a tolerable cost, but it would be a, a big commitment, but not a crazy commitment, because if we want to deal with 20 gigatons, and the world GNP is $100 trillion, but 20 gigatons at $60 a ton, that comes out to be $1.2 trillion. But that's only 1.2% of the world GNP. And the, the GNP of the world, uh, the productivity, because we, we get better at doing things, productivity jumps about 2% a year. So the 1.2% cost doesn't seem so um, onerous. So we sent the paper off, and uh, the referee said that, um, well, it's, it's an idea, but you need some proof from maybe a natural experiment, an experiment in nature, that uh, if you keep the biomass dry, it, it'll last a very long time. And, uh, and so he said, no, go back and add that to the paper. So we actually knew about it, but then we added it. And, and this is a very fascinating story. So this is a, a very famous uh, a tourist attraction in Israel. And it is a mesa. As you can see, it's a mesa. It's adjacent to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has shrunk a little bit because they're using more of the uh, water for agriculture. But the Dead Sea used to come right up to the base of this mesa. This mesa was very easy to defend, and it's famous as the last holdout of the Jewish zealots against the Roman legions. But there was something else uh, was here, and they, they had a king, King Herod. And like most kings, he was afraid of being overthrown. So he built himself a castle up here, and actually this is also part of it, and uh, the, uh, obviously a very easy to defend place, okay? And actually, uh, it sometimes it's called a palace, but it looks to me like more like a, def a defensive fortification. So he builds it up there, and uh, uh, he never needs it. No one tries to overthrow him, uh, but uh, the, uh, it's a very remote location because, uh, uh, first of all, it's, it's very dry, it's very hot, uh, hard to get to, and then you have to climb these vertical cliffs. So it was ignored, it was neglected for 2,000 years. And then an archeologist in the mid 1960s, he says, I'm going to excavate King Herod's castle. So this is what King Herod was supposed to look like. Uh, this is uh, the archeologist, Yigal Yadin, and he goes and he excavates it and uh, he publishes a lot of archeology span papers, but along them he finds these seeds. And these are seeds for a common tree in that region which is the date palm tree. And you can see they're sort of big like pecans. And uh, then uh, he eventually passes away and there's somebody is holding all these archeological treasures. And this woman who is a medical doctor uh, in Jerusalem, she hears about this and she says, she sweet talks the people who are in charge of this and they give her some of these seeds. And she sends the seeds out to be carbon dated and they come back, yep, they're 2000 years old. Okay, and then she gives the seeds to uh, the uh, horticulturalist and says, can you plant these? And she germinates the seeds, okay? And so let me go to the next page, which is figure five of our paper, which is an 18-year-old date palm tree germinated in the year 2005 from 
seeds that were 2,000 years old. And what's the special feature? It was in an extremely dry climate. Okay, it's, uh, the, the top of that mesa is at sea level, the bottom of the mesa is, uh, the, is the, at the uh, deep below sea level, at the Dead Sea. So uh, this was uh, too good to miss out, so we included it in the paper and the referee accepted it. And uh, so uh, the, uh, this tells you a little bit about, yeah, there, we have some proof, which is not always available in, in um, many of the options uh, for dealing with the carbon dioxide problem. Okay, so there's something else to know about agriculture. And that is that it tends to get better because we're human beings, we tend to put some effort into it and it changes, it gets better over time. So this is in agricultural productivity in the least developed countries, the least developed countries and they traced it from 1960 to 2010 and it roughly doubled. And this is common, uh, many things that people do uh, there's, a le there's a learning curve uh, and, uh, or an experience curve and you get better at it. Now, uh, some of it leads to Moore's Law, but this sort of says that there, maybe there's a Moore's Law for agriculture because things get better by a factor of two over a 50-year period. And you know what got better. So we have better seeds, we have fertilizer, uh, uh, we have uh, many other things. Uh, now, uh, so we went and looked up the productivity of land and, and this is the oldest data we could find is from England. The, the productivity for wheat in England. Now going back to the 1700s, and they didn't even use acres back in the 1700s, so we had a lot of unit conversions that we had to give. But uh, of course, at, uh, so we started the graph at 1800, where the data was pretty good, and in, in the early 1800s, we're all taught in high school that Reverend Malthus warned us that the re Industrial Revolution was pointless because we're not gonna have enough food, people are gonna have too many children, and there's not gonna be enough food, okay? And, uh, but it didn't work out that way. And this sort of tells the story is that between 1800 and 1900, the um, productivity of land in England doubled. And then uh, what happened, 1905, you have uh, uh, the uh, Haber process to create artificial fertilizer. And then in the next 50 years, it doubles again. So from 1900 to 1950, it doubles again. And then uh, the next 50 years, it doubles again. So uh, confirming uh, this uh, Moore's Law. And uh, the question is, w always with Moore's Law, is this gonna come to an end? And I would say no, there are going to be further improvements um, because we ha we're going to be able to manipulate the genome of uh, the um, agriculture, of the biomass we'll, uh, with CRISPR, we'll be able to manipulate it more easily. And we, ha and we still have a lot of headroom. Now why is there headroom? So a question that is worth answering is what is the efficiency of, let's say, growing corn? And they've they studied this, it's differential efficiency, just a little bit of extra biomass for a little extra sunlight, and it comes out to be about 2% uh, efficient. So you know, uh, solar panels are uh, roughly 29% uh, efficient, and so uh, the, uh, I, w I would say that's another three factors or two. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about agriculture improving. Uh, but uh, all the cost estimates, uh, estimates I've given you are from the existing type of agriculture, not, nothing about the uh, future. I just wanted to share it with you because it's so interesting. Uh, here's a, another interesting fact. Uh, 1.5 trillion acres of land have fallen out of production because of the improvements in agriculture, because of the Moore's Law for agriculture. And so we can use 68% less land uh, to produce uh, the same amount of food. So uh, there's uh, something to think about. So how are we going to solve the uh, climate crisis? Uh, so uh, it needs to be scalable. Agriculture is one of mankind's largest industries, so it's scalable. The cost, I've told you the cost, it would be 1.2% of the world GNP spread over the next century. Um, stability, so this is something that is often overlooked, is that uh, you can sequester, but is it gonna stay there? Okay, and we have proof that it stays there it, uh, provided you, you provide dryness. So dryness is the big thing. We also need predictability, okay, and s society will not accept uh, a, a, a method that, uh, well, uh, you, you have to come back hundreds of years later to find out if it, if it really worked or there are no bad side effects, et cetera. Uh, so uh, that type of predictability is very essential and uh, it's any approach that, uh, 
is to solve this problem, you have to already know in advance. You can't wait for the experiment to be done. So, and then rapid implementation. So, uh, agro sequestration, it can start with the next growing season. So, it can start in April next year. So, uh, first, some apologies. I'm a high tech guy, but I'm offering a low tech solution. Uh, but uh, a problem of this nature, we cannot take a chance. We have to be very certain how things will turn out hundreds of years from now. And I've given you an example that the agro sequestration is a proven method for uh, uh, at least 2,000 years. Uh, now, uh, as far as w what's going on in the real world, it's, ki it's kind of shocking that 40% of U.S. corn, by the way, U U.S. is the largest corn producer in the world, uh, but 40% of it is used for ethanol, and ethanol is a really dumb idea, and it's far from carbon neutral even. And so it gives you an idea that uh, that, that would be like 40% of Iowa is available just, just from that. But it doesn't mean you would want to use Iowa. But um, obviously, we, uh, well, the government is, uh, different parts of the government are already contracting for biofuel use. Ms. Cantus, uh, I've been told there are um, uh, thousands of acres in Iowa that are already being used to grow miscanthus. And this would be, uh, you, you often get, how are you going to solve the political problems? This is politically acceptable to farmers because it's another cash crop. And uh, so uh, that part is, uh, is going. So uh, my conclusion is that agro sequestration at this point in time appears to be the lowest cost scalable technology that fulfills all those requirements. There might be others, but they would have to be cheaper than, uh, than the agro sequestration. And in an emergency, it could even remove historical carbon dioxide. But we have to be aware of complacency, uh, the moral hazard uh, that, uh, that uh, w we can depend upon this. We have to continue research in new forms of energy. Conservation needs to continue. Alternative energy sources need to be, continue to be developed. Decarbonization uh, will also be needed and other forms of sequestration. So we definitely need an all of the above approach. We should not be tempted uh, to say this solves our problem. So uh, now one of my experiences is that if you really want to get something done, you have to start a company. So we have started a company, uh, and it's called Agro Capture Corp. And we are recruiting at all levels. So I see a lot of students here. Uh, maybe if you're close to graduation, uh, we're recruiting all the way from member of technical staff all the way to CEO. So please send uh, CVs to myself, <laughs> and I uh, hope to hear from some of you. So. Uh, my concluding slide is that we're living with previously uncharted carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Carbon neutral is not enough, uh, and uh, we have to actually be carbon negative. That used to be controversial, but I think it's more or less accepted now. So we need carbon dioxide removal. And uh, let me ask for uh, your questions and to thank you so much for uh, listening. job of talking about some very technical things in plain and simple language, at least from my point of view. So I thought it was terrific. It also is a great, um, a good new old idea, yeah. if I gosh, <laughs> captured your riff right, which does make it tried and true yeah, and yeah, e yeah. easy to understand. Well, sorry, well, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we now have about 10 minutes for questions in the room. We usually give preference to student questions first. Any student questions from our audience here? We have a mic for you. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I, I was doing research in carbon dioxide removal for the past two years, and I came across this one of the solutions that might be possible as well. Um, and with regard to the stability, I wanted to ask, like, if you looked at the stability of the polyethylene that is about to be buried as well, because I know there is some biodegradation of polyethylene as well, and I could imagine that there is some societal concern about uh, microplastics um, polluting um, soils and so on. So I was just ask, asking myself if you considered yeah. these topics as well. That's a really good question. And, uh, you know, we think of uh, uh, that very thick tough uh, polyethylene uh, that uh, it's immune to uh, many of these problems. But you're making a good point. We need to look at that uh, more carefully. 
And uh, the one thing that has been looked at is the diffusivity of water through the polyethylene. That came out to be a very low number, which I indicated. Uh, the, I once visited Dow Chemical because they were making uh, roof shingles uh, that had solar panels on them. And uh, one of the uh, scientists there pulled me over and said, you know, it's not the solar panel that where the high technology is. The high technology is in the plastic that stays up on the roof for 50 years with the sun beating down on it and does not degrade. So the hope is that uh, uh, usually that's it. It's photo uh, degradation. But by being underground, maybe that uh, won't be a problem. So, but you never know. There might be uh, some other issue. So it's a very good point. Thank you as well for your talk. Um, thank you. Um, as an undergraduate student who doesn't know much about um, long-term effects of this nature, how long does your company plan to continue sequestering carbon underground for how many decades or centuries okay. before? Uh, so I should say the company is just a startup, so we haven't sequestered anything yet. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but then it's really up to society and also up to the experts here at the, uh, at the School of Sustainability is how long does it need to be? Does it, but I think the estimates are pretty long. Uh, the, uh, if, if you really want to say that you've solved the problem, uh, at least a thousand years, okay, and uh, preferably longer. So I think that's, uh, uh, and, that, and the cause of that is that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere uh, for such a long period of time. And so we really need to have uh, good, stable, uh, predictable, long-term solutions. Hi. Oh. Hi, a uh, really interesting presentation idea. Thank you so much for sharing. So I had a question about your, you know, kind of some of your thoughts about fertilizer inputs for some of these crops. So you mentioned in your analysis, right, that the fertilizer inputs for these sorts of crops would be less than for food crops. But I'm curious, how concerned are you about, say, the long-term sequestration about um, some of these nutrients underground? You know, you know, fixed nitrogen is one thing, but what about minerals like phosphorus, where the world supply is limited, say, and the, those things are considered less, you know, less renewables than like fixed right. nitrogen? Right. So one of the things, if you look in, in the details of the paper and the supplementary information, we uh, try to analyze everything. One of the concepts that we introduce is carbon efficiency. So if you sequester uh, 100 tons of carbon dioxide, uh, but you've, you, you have farm equipment, uh, you have tractors, you have fertilizer, and so forth. So the question is, what is the carbon efficiency of this process? So I think every, uh, every scheme needs to do that. So we've uh, taken into account uh, uh, those things, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that we have to uh, provide uh, some fertilizer and so forth. So it turns out our carbon efficiency is 95%. So if we sequester uh, 100 tons and to grow and bury the 100 tons, it meant we needed farm equipment, we needed fertilizer, we needed all that stuff. So uh, uh, that's... Um, uh, a very important uh, factor to uh, keep in mind. And I think one of the reasons it's so high is that uh, if it's a non-food crop, uh, you, you, uh, you do get a, a lot more biomass. Uh, uh, so, uh, but, uh, and, and some of the uh, minerals that you're talking about, they, ca they can be replaced, but the question is what are the costs. So we've included the costs of uh, replacing uh, the minerals uh, in the 95%. Now, so, uh, so we came to a very good conclusion and uh, I was sort of satisfied with it, but my co-author said, no, no, it can be over 100%. How can you have over 100% carbon efficiency? He says, because we're putting roots into the ground and we're not taking into account uh, the fact that we've, put, uh, we've sequestered some carbon into the roots. And I'm a little suspicious of that because uh, uh, we don't know how long that's gonna last. But, uh, so he was already uh, ready to claim over 100% carbon efficiency, but I'm not going to go that far. Hi, uh, thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, wh is there a value in burying these crops into the ground or is the value of the crops lost when buried? Uh, well, there's value in the sense that it, um, uh, the uh, carbon sequestration, you get carbon credits, the carbon credits cost a certain amount. So uh, it's not like a pointless form of agriculture and the farmer gets paid uh, per ton. So that, that, that part is good. But uh, if you're asking, is it valuable to humanity to have all this carbon 
uh, all, or all this biofuel uh, or feedstock to have it buried in the ground. I say it's valuable because you never know when the situation might change and we know where, where all the stuff is. And, uh, and uh, at some point, there, uh, we might be so successful, there might be an ice age and we want to try to reverse it. So uh, I, I'm just like being very futuristic. <laughs> and so I, I, would, I, I, I feel comfortable uh, knowing that it's there. Any more questions in the room? Yeah, uh, this will be the last question. Uh, a couple of comments, actually. Yeah. To the question about the thing about Miss Kansas switchgrass and these, they're perennials. And after each season, a lot of the minerals and stuff get drawn back to the roots because they, the plant's going to be there for 10 years. So a lot of the stuff, um, it doesn't have to be the, the expensive stuff. Phosphorus is a problem, but again, it, it's fine. Another comment, um, there is actually a carbon fi fixation in the roots. It's at the level of a percent, maybe a fraction, that actually stays in the soil. Mm -hmm. And so again, these perennials actually do stick carbon yeah. back in the soil, yeah. uh, unlike so, the yeah. food crops, which are depleting. So I should not have criticized my co-author. Maybe we can, we can get above yeah, 95%. You should look, yeah, you should look at it, uh, it, it because there is some fixation. Finally, um, when I was doing these calculations of biomass mm. underground, I found that you had to, uh, Ms. Cantus switchcraft is light and fluffy. You have to compress it to yes. the density of wood. Yes, yes. And that's another cost. And if yeah. you talk about, and in one of your slides, you showed, uh, I think it was a giga, a couple of gigatons. Yeah. Uh, compared to the amount of land, yeah. but that's one year. But you want to yeah, do yeah, year yeah, after yeah. year after year, yeah. and so so you really need high density, and yeah. and you, you're going to need deeper than thirty meters, <laughs> yeah. because if you want to store it for decades. Yeah. Well, uh, the um, uh, we can uh, do the fine tuning on the thirty meters offline. Uh, the um, uh, basically. Uh, I'm in agreement uh, with the things you said. Uh, the, w with regard to the cost of replenishing the soil and so forth, we took those into account yeah. that, as best That's we under could. control. It's more, yeah. more the volume that I'm okay, concerned let me, about. Let me say something and, the and because in your graph you yeah. said, here's the amount of cro row crop land, and okay. this is one-tenth of row yeah. crop land for so one year. Uh, the the uh, built into this that I haven't mentioned, uh, thanks to my co-author, he identified this problem. And uh, so we have the drying function and the compressing function. So uh, your average density of garbage is about uh, 0.4, and we need to compress uh, to one. So we need to really compress it a lot. Okay, so and those calculations so were So that was in there, yeah. Okay. The compression was in there, and uh, you know, there's uh, certain uh, things, costs associated with that. And we, we try to uh, include all of that uh, stuff, but it's a very good point. Great, we're just about out of time, so I'd like to thank Professor Ivanovich for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.